Um, so welcome, uh, welcome everyone to our MedStar Emergency Physicians pop-up learning session, uh, COVID-19 sessions. Uh, we're very pleased to have Rory Spiegel, um, who is our uh, Director of Education and Research for the MedStar Emergency Physicians section of critical care, along with Eric Kreiner, uh, who's a lead respiratory therapist at MedStar Washington Hospital Center uh, and does a tremendous amount of work with the pulmonary critical care uh, medicine team. Uh, in the um, Department of Critical Care at the Hospital Center. Uh, we'd also like to welcome our hospitalist partners who are joining us today. Uh, we have a great, great pop-up learning session planned on uh, ventilator management and ventilator knobology. Uh, there'll be plenty of opportunities for questions, so please um, feel free to, to send them along during the course of the presentation. Uh, again, jonathan.davis at medstar.net. Uh, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Rory and Eric. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having us again. Um, so what we're going to do today is kind of event primer. Um, this works best as a chalk talk, which I've kind of tried to set up today, and hopefully this will work out. Um, but what we're going to go through is kind of how I like to think about ventilators and how you can kind of approach them. Um, and then we're going to turn the camera over to Eric, and we'll kind of walk through how you actually do this on the ventilator. Um, obviously, there's no way you can really become completely competent with vents with the you know 30 to 45 minutes that we have here. Um, but what we're going to do is kind of get you ready to understanding what the basics that you're asking a ventilator to do, um, and most importantly, kind of when you've surpassed your understanding of, and when to call for help. Um, so I think with any kind of ventilator topic, you kind of have to first talk about how we normally breathe because. Um, a ventilator is trying to to uh, reproduce that in certain ways, um, and it succeeds in some ways, but fails in a whole lot of others. And that's most of the time when you get into trouble is when the ventilator is doing a poor job of reproducing normal breath. Um, and so what we're gonna look at is a pretty basic model. Um, we're gonna keep this fairly simple. But if this is a volume, curve um, over time, right? And so as you, as someone takes a breath in, the volume in their lungs slowly increases until it reaches its tidal volume or the amount of breath you take in per breath. And then you start to exhale and it goes out again. And there's a period when there's no air in your lungs or you're back to your functional residual capacity, which is essentially the amount of air in your lungs after a passive exhale. And then you take another breath in. And when you reach your tidal volume, you come back down, right? And the amazing thing is this is all done spontaneously without you thinking, you know, driven by your central respiratory center in your brain um, and dependent on the mechanics of your lung and the strength of your diaphragm, so on and so forth. Um, and what we're trying to do is reproduce this on the vent. So, I broke this down into two areas of what we're talking about. You're thinking components of ventilation and components of oxygenation. And when you think about people and how we actually breathe, we are primarily driven by components of ventilation. And most of the things that cause us to breathe are managing our own CO2. So if I had everyone here hold their breath and basically told you to keep holding it as long as you can, and then you'd each raise your hand when you have to breathe again. Don't do it. Um, but I've done this multiple times with multiple groups all over the country, and basically at about a minute, a minute and a half, everyone will breathe. Unbelievable to drive to breathe at that point. And when I ask people what they think their CO2 has gotten up to, you get numbers all over the place. But essentially, your CO2 has basically gone from 40, which is normal, to 43. And within that tight range, you have had an unbelievable drive to keep breathing. And the, the moral of this story is essentially is that we maintain our CO2s in a very, very tight range. Our oxygenation far less so. So most of patients' respiratory drive is done through, through the ventilatory process. Um, so we're going to define each of these things here. The first thing I have written down is trigger. And so this is what initiates a breath. If we're normally just breathing, what initiates a breath is a rising CO2. In fact, if you hyperventilate someone down to a CO2 of 20, they don't have a big drive to breathe, right? That's why people, when they're doing breath holding contests or deep dive contests, will hyperventilate to get their CO2 down low to suppress that respiratory drive. What we're going to talk about on the ventilator is what kind of triggers you actually have to stimulate a person to breathe. So the next thing is the respiratory rate. So how often is someone breathing per minute? And again, mostly this is driven by your metabolic load or the amount of CO2 you have. We normally, 
breathe about 12, 10 to 12 times a minute. Um, and that typically will manage a normal CO2 load. As you start having increasing amounts of CO2, for example, if you're exercising and you have working muscle and your CO2 levels rise, your respiratory rate also rises. Um, in pathological states like DKA or other things where you're increasing your metabolic load, your respiratory rate rises to compensate for that. The next is the tidal volume. So the amount of uh, air or gas that is in, brought into the lung with each breath. Um, this is somewhat more complicated. Um, it basically is driven by the need to breathe off CO2, but it's dependent on a couple things, which is the, the natural compliance of the lung, the position of your diaphragm, and the strength of your diaphragm. Um, and most of the time we get by breathing in normal tidal volumes of four to 500. We do it quietly, comfortably. We're all sitting here now. I'm probably breathing a little bit faster than the rest of you because I'm slightly nervous. But otherwise, um, this is mostly determined uh, by the state of our lung um, and the strength of our diaphragm and the need to blow off CO2. Now, the important part is we all walk around breathing every single day. And when we exercise, we breathe a little harder. Um, and when we don't exercise, we breathe a little less hard. But we don't we have an intrinsic ability to control our lung volumes within a safe range. And that's so important because when we talk about what we do to patients, when we take over these controls, we have to figure out a way how to determine that we too are, are, are giving them an appropriate tidal volume, right? But they can intrinsically do it. We're not checking plateau pressures or other means of testing someone's lung volumes when everyone's just walking around breathing comfortably. And so that's an important thing to note. The next two, which is flow and inspiratory time, are slightly less important from, um, for you to focus on. I put them here because they're somewhat important for patient control and comfort. These two are obviously instinctively controlled by us as we breathe, right? If everyone's taking a breath in now, you can see as you take a breath, it starts off slow reaches a peak speed, and then slows back down at the peak inspiratory flows before you exhale. That's your normal flow pattern. Inspiratory time, again, is really controlled by how much air you're pulling in and how quickly um, and how many breaths you need to take. So it's more of a secondary factor. Now, the factors on the right side of your screen your PEEP and your FiO2 that I have in blue, these are factors of oxygenation. And in normal everyday life, we don't think about them right? We're breathing room air and we're appropriately oxygenated and our PEEP or our, N, our positive end expiratory pressure is zero because we're functioning as PEEP independent creatures. These become a lot more important when you put someone on the ventilator. Um, and I want you to think about them in a basic fashion as these are the determinants of a patient's oxygen saturation. These are the tools you have to use. Now, FiO2 is a direct determinant of someone's oxygen saturation. As you increase the FiO2, you increase their oxygen saturation. As you decrease it, you can decrease their oxygen saturation to a point. PEEP is somewhat of a, a, a roundabout way of controlling oxygen. It's really a way of controlling lung architecture. So right now, as I said, we're all PEEP independent. Our lungs are staying open at rest. And so we have the appropriate amount of air going to a lung that has the appropriate amount of blood flow. And so we don't have much shunt physiology, which is the phenomenon we talked about in our last WebEx kind of pop-up meeting where we said that blood is coming from the right side of heart, going to the lungs because the lung is collapsed and not participating in ventilation. The blood is passing through the lung, not getting oxygen and going to the left side of the heart. That's shunt physiology. Um, we have very little now, all of us sitting here. Um, but if you put someone, even with healthy lungs, on a ventilator, sedate them and lie them flat for any amount of time, you will start to de-recruit or lose your posterior lung fields and start to develop shunt physiology. And so we use PEEP on the ventilator to try to maintain that normal lung physiology to prevent de-recruitment. And as someone has increasing oxygen requirements, we can use PEEP and FiO2 in combination to try to keep the lung open and provide the appropriate amount of um, FiO2. All right, so that's kind of the basic thought of what's happening every time you breathe. Um, now, let's say we have someone who was just intubated and they went through an RSI, so they got a sedative and a paralytic. And with those medications, we have essentially taken out their central drive to breathe and their muscular ability to breathe. So now we are tasked with accomplishing all these things that we do every day without thinking about it. All right, so I'm just gonna kind of run from there. Um, 
I'm not sure if you guys can see this one, but what I have here is I've lifted out different modes of ventilation on the side, which we'll talk about, and then each of these factors that we've kind of go over right now. And so the basic mode of ventilation, which you can't, can't technically do on a ventilator anymore, um, but is continuous mandatory ventilation. And this is essentially the patient is paralyzed, they're not breathing at all on their own, and you are doing everything for the patient, right? So you are determining their tidal volume, you are determining their trigger or when they breathe. And the way you set that is essentially you're going to set a respiratory rate. And so the trigger will fire however many times a minute, depending on your respiratory rate, which you're also determining. You're also determining their flow. And traditionally, this is just a standard flow. So you set a set flow and it'll be a continuous flow at that time. So um, this is something that you set and it will continue that way. And then your inspiratory time is also set in a roundabout way because you've set a tidal volume and a flow. And so basically your machine will inspire until this total tidal volume is breathed in, right? And then it will cut off and let the patient pass the exhale. You are also setting your PEEP and your FiO2 or your oxygen requirements. What we've been talking about is essentially this idea that you're doing everything for the patient. Now I will tell you, we do this far less well than the patient themselves, meaning this is terribly uncomfortable for patients. They hate it because you can imagine that you are being forced to breathe a certain amount of times a minute at a certain flow with a certain tidal volume that you have no control over. And just because we think we're doing it well, we are apparently not. And so no ventilator will actually will set this mode anymore because we found it's just far too uncomfortable for patients to be locked into a certain tidal volume at a certain rate at a certain flow. But if the patient is paralyzed and you're breathing for them all, even other modes that allow them to do more are essentially similar to this mode right here. So that's why we start with this. Um, and so you will set each one of these things. So no ventilator does this anymore. The next thing that we talk about is volume AC. So this is the cis control ventilation and you're determining the tidal volume. So again, when you're doing this, you're gonna be setting the tidal volume. So you're determining how much breath is going into the patient. You're gonna be determining the trigger and the trigger here is set in two ways. It's either set by your respiratory rate. So you set a respiratory rate, let's say it's 12 to 15 and you set it, um, but you're also allowing the patient to take a breath over the top of that. So you set a trigger, essentially, uh, it can be a tr pressure trigger. So if the vent sense that the patient's trying to take a, a, a breath in and then pressure drops down negative, it will actually deliver the tidal volume you gave it to. So the patient can't control their tidal volume. Even if they want to take their own breath, all they can do is stimulate or trigger their breath, but it's still going to deliver the tidal volume that you set. You, you determine the flow rate, you determine the eye time, you determine the PEEP, and you determine the FiO2. <laughs> so again, sure you are controlling almost everything on this ventilator. And again, it's not the most comfortable thing in the world for the patient, and it's harder and harder for them to actually breathe. So the next step is something called pressure assist control. Um, and other than volume assist control, you actually set the pressure. And what this allows is to happen is now the patient can determine their own tidal volume. So you're giving them a certain pressure, but they can pull in as much tidal volume as they want, as long as their lung actually has the compliance to do so and the diaphragm can do so. The trigger is still set by you. The respiratory rate is still set by you, but now the flow is set by them. Because again, they can breathe in at a certain flow time. Unfortunately here, the inspiratory time is still set by you and it becomes a little more complicated because you actually have to determine a set inspiratory time. So you say, I'm gonna deliver a certain pressure for a certain amount of time and they get whatever tidal volume and flow they want for this. You continue to deliver a normal PEEP and a set FiO2. And so this allows the patient a little more independence and a little more comfort because of that. The problem is, now the tidal volume is no longer controlled by you and there's a risk that the patient can take tidal volumes that are too big and that are dangerous. So our next is pressure support and this even allows more control because now again you're setting a pressure but you're allowing the patient to determine their tidal volume. 
The trigger is now their own breaths. You're allowing the patient to determine the breath, the trigger. You're allowing the patient to determine the rate and the patient to determine the flow. And the eye time is actually determined by the patient as well because it cuts off when the patient's inspiratory effort starts to drop down to zero. And so now what you're determining is the FiO2 and the P. And so this is a far more comfortable breathing pattern for the patient. Unfortunately, um, it takes a lot more kind of nuance and understanding of what you have to do to be good at it because you're giving the patient back a lot of independence. Um, I'm going to stop and just ask for questions before we move on to our next part. So Rory, one, uh, one question that we got is um, mm -hmm. if it's possible, um, we'll send out this paper um, as mm -hmm. an attachment um, following yeah. uh, the pop-up learning. Yeah, of course. Um, so this is kind of overview on how you kind of think about ventilators and what you do. Um, in the situation where you have to manage a ventilator and you're not so comfortable with it, volume AC modes, so this mode right here that basically allows you to control the most factors is the easiest mode to control. And so that's what we're gonna focus on. And that's what Eric is gonna show you about. And so what you are gonna set on this ventilator um, when you get the patient and we're assuming the patient either is either paralyzed so not breathing or sedated enough to tolerate where they can't where the machine is going to be doing most of the breathing for them um, you have to set the title volume right and you can set it at whatever you want and when we get to the ventilator we're going to talk about it you set the respiratory rate and we'll talk about what appropriate respiratory rates are you are going to set the flow. Um, it's usually a standard. It's a default. We'll kind of talk about it for, in a sec. And you're going to set a peep. And an FiO2. And so if you set these four things, this will give you an adequate amount of control for the patient and you can now control your ventilation with your tidal volume and your respiratory rate and your oxygenation with your PEEP and your FiO2. And so, because you're doing all the work for the patient and you're controlling them and you've taken away their ability to control these aspects of ventilation, you now have to check them. Like I said, if we're walking around right now breathing, nobody's checking what my CO2 level is or what my oxygen level is because I'm managing that all by myself. But once I sedate someone and paralyze them and take away their ability to manage this stuff and you're managing it for them, you have to understand that we don't do it very well. And so that's why you check blood gases to actually see if you're doing an adequate job of ventilation and oxygenation. And so the way we set our tidal volume and our respiratory rate is this. We're gonna set our tidal volume based on what we think is a safe tidal volume for the patient. And we talked about this a little bit in our ARDS lecture. But essentially, you're gonna to try to shoot for lung volumes of six to eight cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight. So I said you kind of shoot for somewhere around 400 to 450 um, would give you an adequate uh, tidal volume for most patients. Now the the important thing to note is it's not perfect for everybody. And because you don't have the intrinsic sense like we do when we're breathing, you need to figure out a way to actually check that. I'm gonna, let's see if we can actually put these up here. Is that better? That's better, much clearer. And if you, okay. you also have a, uh, a marker by chance, I think that might uh, also make it really okay. I don't, we'll have to do this for the next one, I apologize. Um, and so what we're gonna do here is when you set your tidal volume, we're approximating, remember, so we're trying to set a tidal volume of six to eight cc's per kg, and I say you estimate about 350 to 450, depending on the patient's size. Now, there's lots of good data that that value is not very predictive of the patient's actual lung volume, so the important thing you have to do here is check a plateau pressure. Right? And we talked about this last time, and we're going to go with Eric over how you actually check the plateau pressure. But this checking the plateau pressure is the surrogate for saying, is the tidal volume I'm giving an appropriate size for the lung that the patient has? 
once you have set your tidal volume to an appropriate size for that patient's lung, you fix it. Don't change it, right? And so because that's a fixed number, managing the patient's CO2 is dependent purely on the respiratory rate. And so you increase your respiratory rate if you want to ventilate the patient more or there's more of a CO2 load and you decrease it if you want to ventilate them less. And you're going to do it within the range of 12 to 35. At 35, you're getting very worried about the fact that you're not going to be able to fully exhale by the time the next breath goes in. So that's all you really need to think about for ventilation are these two factors. And so for oxygenation, it's PEEP and FiO2. Um, your goal with FiO2 is to get it as low as possible, keeping their oxygen saturation over about 92%. And last time we kind of went over the PEEP tables where you can actually titrate up your PEEP based on your FiO2 requirements um, is a safe and simple way of doing that. And we'll include these as the notes, but essentially for any given FiO2 you require, you're gonna increase your PEEP. But what I want you to think about is you can use PEEP as the FiO2 requirements go up, you can also increase your PEEP to try to decrease your shunt fraction. That makes sense so far? Great. Okay. Um, why don't I take questions? Because I think at this point we can just move over and actually do the practical stuff because I think it'll become far more apparent at that point. So are there any questions that uh, Dr. Spiegel can answer at the, at the moment? And I will, uh, I'll chime in if I get any uh, additional um, email questions. Uh, but why don't we go ahead and move over to the vent and we'll incorporate the questions as they come. Okay, cool. So quickly in summary before I move over, really when you're actually sending your initial vent settings, you want to keep it as simple as possible. And so you're going to put them on a volume assist control, which what we talked about gives you the most control, but takes the most control away from the patient. And so it is the least comfortable mode for the patient. And so you might require more sedation to deal with it. But this allows you to set very few things and get a reasonable control of the patient. And that's tidal volume, respiratory rate, PEEP, and FiO2. All right, so why don't we move over to the vent and we'll kind of go over how we actually do that. You guys see that? Very clear. Thank you. Um, okay, there we are. Okay. Hi there, everybody. My name is Eric Kreiner. I am the adult critical care clinical specialist for respiratory therapy at MedStar Washington Hospital Center. Um, I am going to show you around the ventilator that MedStar Health has bought, you know, system-wide here. It's called the Servo U, um, and attempt to get you up and running and get those basic settings into the ventilator and do some basic monitoring, okay? Um, I do want to point out one thing, if I can zoom out a little bit. There we go. That's pretty good. Um, out of the ventilator here, you have an inspiratory valve and an expiratory valve, clearly. Um, and so one of the most important things that you're going to have to do to configure the ventilator to be safe in this situation is place a HEPA filter on the expiratory valve of this ventilator. Some ventilator uh, platforms have a built-in HEPA, uh, HEPA filter, some do not. Uh, so you need to be really careful as you walk up to a different looking machine and really kind of evaluate and ask questions about whether the exhaled gas is filtered or not. On um, this particular platform, the Servo U, this expiratory gas is not filtered. So what you would have to imagine is that your patient exhales everything out of their lung, it goes through the machine, and it actually comes out of the back. So it's really important that we put a HEPA filter of some sort uh, onto the expiratory valve. It easily connects between the expiratory limb of the ventilator and the expiratory valve here. Um, your respiratory therapist would be well versed in and have these supplies, hopefully, and be able to help you out with this. But it's something to always question and, and make sure that it's done in kind of a mental checklist type of way. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and move a little bit closer here. Um, I'm just going to kind of show us around. Uh, am, am I right to assume that we have good respiratory therapy coverage here or poor respiratory therapy coverage here? 
How, sh how should we approach this? I think the assumption was you have poor respiratory Okay, coverage. so we have poor resource uh, utilization and, and scarcity in, in respiratory therapy. So I'm gonna go into some, some detail and try to kind of keep it as easy as I can at that point. Then. All right, uh, this is the standby screen of the ventilator. When you turn the ventilator on itself, um, going in reverse, I'll show you that on, uh, at the very end because it's on the back of the machine. This is the standby screen. Um, and to get the ventilator started out of standby, you simply have to hit start. Um, this is asking me about a pre-use check, and I'm just going to hit start ventilation again. So this is, I hope it's, the glare isn't too bad. Are we able to kind of visualize that? Can we check that before we go further? Yeah, we can, we can visualize it, Eric. Thank you. Okay. All right. Very good. So, um, I will kind of walk us around the screen and point out some of the key things that are going on here. Okay, they're not talking about that. Up here in the top left of the monitoring screen here is the mode indicator. Uh, right now, as Rory said, the um, conventional mode of, of mechanical ventilation is assist control, which is all mandatory breaths, and the control variable that which you are setting to go in is volume. Uh, so the kind of shorthand name of that is volume control. This is how the ventilator displays it. It does a very good job at uh, not using proprietary abbreviations and that sort of thing. So it spells it out to you right here. I'm going to kind of come down to six o'clock on the ventilator uh, because these are the key things that you will be using. These are the prescriber order settings. Here you have the FIO2 and PEEP, uh, as Rory pointed out, the, the oxygenators essentially. And right beside it, you you have the rate and the tidal volume, essentially your ventilators, okay? So you can kind of divide your brain in half and use it in that context there, all right? Uh, to change these ventilator settings, it's really pretty user-friendly. I'm gonna go ahead and do this one here. I'm gonna select the FIO2 just by pressing, and all of the settings look identical in this kind of format, in which a plus or minus uh, bar or button comes up that is kind of begging you to, to use that to change these settings. Well, it will time out, so that's a good uh, indicator there that I didn't make a change, so it automatically timed out. Uh, so I will reopen that, and I'm going to go ahead, because I'm in an office here, and I don't have any uh, piped in gas, I'm gonna turn it down to 21% so that I can run on my air compressor. To select or uh, approve that setting, essentially, I'm gonna hit the check mark. Again, if you do not hit the check mark here, you have not engaged any of the settings that you had intended to do, as demonstrated there. Okay, so select this by going down, in our case here, and then the check mark, and then you'll see that the change you intended to make was engaged at that point. All right, so I think the key things here are mode indicator and then uh, prescriber order settings, the four main ones. All right. Um, I will show you this here. Um, let, me, let me get to some of the, uh, we'll, we'll cover all the basic stuff and then we'll kind of dive into some of the other more detailed information. So uh, down the right hand side of the ventilator, this is your patient monitoring section essentially going down this side of the ventilator. Um, it is non-configurable. So when you walk up to this particular ventilator where in whatever facility you're in, it will look exactly like this. All right, so uh, the ventilator, again, does a pretty decent job of not using uh, strange proprietary definitions or, or abbreviations or symbols. Uh, that They do a pretty good job of spelling things out. So you can see peak pressure here, P peak. Uh, respiratory rate is here. That is your total respiratory rate. There's VTE, which uh, is your tidal volume. And then there's MVE over here in the second column. That's your minute ventilation. I will kind of point out those are kind of your four big dynamic measurements that you're paying attention to there. The ventilator does use some uh, subscripts here. Uh, you can see that there's a VTE. I'm not quite sure whether how detailed that comes out. But uh, I'll show you here that where it says 443, it says VTE. The E is a little subscript. Right next to it, it says VTI. The ventilator is monitoring inspiration or inspiratory tidal volume as well as expiratory tidal volume. And in this case, because you're setting the inspiratory tidal volume, I'm going to focus you on getting all the 
E values, all the expiratory values essentially, okay? Um, so peak, total rate, exhaled volume, and exhaled minute ventilation is what is kind of uh, displayed to you there, all right? Uh, one of the other uh, vitally important things to kind of understand are your static measurements, uh, and that is essentially your plateau pressure um, on inspiration. Your plateau pressure is, is really trying to represent uh, alveolar pressure, and this is specifically inspiratory alveolar pressure, or that which you're putting in. Um, this ventilator, this is going to be, you know, for, for those people that are just kind of walking up to the machine, this is going to be the, the difficult part because it's a little bit hidden. So if you kind of remember that, that it's not straightforward, you're not going to see one single button here, um, you'll at least be started along your way. I'm going to go over here down the left-hand side of the screen, and there's these functions uh, that are down the left-hand side of the screen. One of them is called maneuvers. Um, to get a plateau pressure or an alveolar pressure on in, at, in, at end inspiration, you have to do a maneuver. You have to do an inspiratory hold maneuver specifically. So kind of keep that in your back pocket as well. Maneuvers makes a little bit more sense. All right, I'm going to hit maneuvers. And there's a number of different ones here. The one that we're going to key in on is the static measurements. All right, so I'm going to hit static measurements here. And if you were counting along there, that's two buttons. So your plateau pressure uh, function, how you're going to measure it via an inspiratory hold maneuver is actually two to three buttons away here. All right. So uh, not the easiest uh, setup, but that's what we got uh, on this particular platform. You can see here the static measurements are all displayed out here. None of them are, are populated as of yet because I haven't done these inspiratory or expiratory holds. So to do so, to get your plateau pressure during an inspiratory hold, I'm going to press and hold this button. You hear the ventilator beep back at you. When you do that, uh, or when you hear that beep, it's telling you that it's actually in the process of performing that maneuver. The actual inspiratory hold maneuver is pretty short uh, to, to get a good plateau pressure measurement. It doesn't need to be any more than half a second to one second. So I did it kind of fast as I would do it at the bedside. But as, as I've described to you there, some of the little details, we'll kind of go over it again and I'll show you some of the idiosyncrasies of this. So inspiration is happening and I'm holding it now. Notice nothing's happening until the beep happens. And then the breath was held for as long as I actually depressed the inspiratory hold button. So in kind of a recap of that, I'm gonna press this. It will beep when it's functional. That's the key thing. Uh, many people wanna just press it once and then kind of and feel that that's it. Uh, you have to press and hold until you hear the beep, okay? As soon as you hear the beep, you, you let it go. When we do that uh, and we perform the maneuver and we perform the inspiratory hold, uh, the ventilator will display to us the plateau pressure, which is the end inspiratory alveolar pressure. And this one right now is measuring 22. All right, so that's displayed there. You might notice over here on the right hand side in this monitoring section that when I do the maneuver, it's immediately showing me 23 there, but as soon as the next breath is delivered, it goes away because the plateau pressure is no longer relevant because the breaths has, have essentially marched forward, all right? It is recorded here for you, uh, but visualized or shown to you during that individual breath over here on the right, all right? So <coughs> just a brief kind of explanation. Uh, I wish it was more straightforward than that, that we could just hit a button and it did the whole thing for us. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case. You kind of have to work with it a little bit. So press and hold until you hear the beep and then just let it go and you will get your uh, inspiratory hold maneuver done and your plateau pressure measured out for you. All right. Um, so I would say that, you know, as, as you begin to manage these patients, uh, you have settings and then you have monitoring. The settings we've kind of gone through pretty straightforwardly are the mode control, which is volume, or the mode indicator, which is volume, and then the prescriber ordered settings, oxygenators and ventilators. 
Then you have the management or the monitoring side of things. Most everything is displayed to you here. However, you will need to perform an inspiratory hold maneuver to get uh, what I think is probably the most, the most important uh, monitoring tool that you have to get on these patients, patients which is the uh, plateau pressure. All right? So I think, I think we will, what we'll do now is we'll just set this up on an imaginary patient. So we'll pretend we have someone coming in and we'll prescribe them some ventilatory settings. There's a whole other part of this, which is troubleshooting the vent when it's going wrong. And I think that we'll have to wait for a, a whole other kind of WebEx meeting if this is useful because that in of itself is kind of an art form and I think would get us carried away here. What I really want you guys to get out of this essentially is I've got a patient. How do I initially set them up and what are the markers I look for to make sure I'm doing it appropriately? Um, Claire, can we go back to standby? Sure. So let's imagine we had the patient we talked about. We just intubated them so they are paralyzed and intubated and sedated and we want to get them on the ventilator. So we're going to do start ventilation. We're going to start a ventilation, and it has already set us up on volume control, but that's up here in the corner where you can see our actual mode of ventilation is set at volume control, right? And once we accept that, at the bottom are the four, vent, the four actual criteria or factors that we want to set. So let's start with our um, factors of ventilation here, which is tidal volume and respiratory rate, right? And we said our tidal volume is set and we want to set it and, and keep it there. And this is, we're estimating what the actual volume of lung the patient has. And so that's typically set as six to eight cc's per kg of ideal body weight. Now, that's somewhat complicated because ideal body weight is based off of height, not based off of actual body weight. Um, but as I've said before, the actual how well this actually predicts the size of a patient lung is not great. So I typically tend to eyeball it for um, a, a small man or a woman. I usually use 400 and for a larger man, I usually use 450. And then I, most important thing is checking your work. What we just went over with an inspiratory hold is essentially asking, is the tidal volume I'm giving appropriate for the patient? And this is the most important thing to do at this point, because I want to make sure I'm delivering a tidal volume that's safe for this patient. And like we said, we go to the inspiratory maneuvers, static measurements, inspiratory hold, and then I get it. And they have a tidal volume of 20, or a plateau pressure of 23, that's under what we say is 30, so we think that's probably an appropriate tidal volume for this patient. So once we've set their tidal volume, now we have to go to our respiratory. Remember, the combination of these two give us our minute ventilation, right? And this is what's gonna manage our CO2. We have it set at 15. I typically start at between 15 and 18 um, on a normal patient. You have somewhat extra dead space in the circuit, so you need a slightly higher minute ventilation than you do on a normal person, which tends to be between five and six. So I'll start this at 15 to 18, and then you titrate your respiratory rate based off the patient's CO2, meaning you don't want to touch your tidal volume. You're only going to go up and down on your respiratory rate. Um, and the sicker the patient gets, the less perfect you're shooting for a CO2. But I think now to keep it simple, we're trying to shoot for a normal CO2 and we're using our respiratory rate to get there. So those are our markers or our factors of ventilation. We're going to move over to our factors of oxygenation. This deviates slightly from person to person, but what I like to do is drop my oxygen right after I've intubated them down to 40% and titrate up from there. What this allows me to do, if I stay at 100%, I can mask a lot of peep or a lot of atelectasis, and I won't actually know what my PO2 levels are. If I go down to 40% immediately, I will start to see desaturations if the patient has any shunt physiology. And that allows me to titrate up both my FiO2 and my by peep together to get an appropriate level. So let's say I go down to 40%. We can't go, if I do this on the vent, will it start alarming? So I'll go to 40%, right, and I have a PEEP of 5. And let's say my oxygen saturation is 85%. So that's telling me that for this patient, there's a certain degree of shunt physiology here. And so some of the blood that's going from the right heart to the left is not actually being oxygenated as it passes through the lungs. And what I'm going to try to do is go up on my PEEP. So let's say I go up to 8. And I see what happens. You have to give the patient a few minutes to respond to this. Um, and if this doesn't work, I'll go up to 10. And then there's a nice PEEP table that will include in this that as you go up on your PEEP, you go up on your FiO2. So um, if I remember the PEEP table correctly, at this point, I would go up to 
And then if that doesn't work, I drive my cube up to 12. And I keep going up this ladder until I get an appropriate, FI or appropriate oxygen saturation, which is somewhere around 88 to 94%. Somewhere in that range is ideal. You can do it off the of blood gas shooting for a PaO2 greater than 60. I like to do it off the oxygen saturation as long as I have a reasonable waveform because I think it's easier and you can titrate quicker and you don't have to draw blood gases. So that is kind of the basic idea. Those are the four variables you're going to use to set up your vent. Um, and those are the the factors that you're going to check once you've set it up is your plateau pressure, your PCO2, and your oxygen saturation. And you're going to adjust these variables based on those factors. Any other comments? Well, uh, I don't know. So we, we went over the ventilation uh, and the use of the ventilators and how you use the rate. Or the rate. And we discussed the PEEP and FiO2 combination or that table for the oxygen. And we said that you want to monitor the plateau and we showed you how to get it, um, but uh, we didn't discuss this, right? And so we were telling people to monitor the plateau, uh, keep it below 30. I think it is worth here just kind of glossing over that what if your plateau is greater than 30? Uh, what should you do? Uh, and I think what, what that is indicating to you, that the technical term would be volume trauma. And what, what is happening is that you're putting too much of a dose of volume, and I refer to it as a dose. And if we think about it that way, then I think it's, it means a little bit more uh, to us that the dose of volume that we're putting into our patient's lung is causing too much stretch and too much pressure with inside of that lung. And so to fix that, the most direct way is to lower the dose of volume. Right? And so if this plateau pressure that we measured came back at 32 or 33, how do you get out of that scenario is to actually uh, decrease your volume. Now, I, I don't mean to leave you kind of on a cliff here, but it, it takes some thought as you start to do this, but those are the straightforward changes. Um, you know, just just imagine here that, that every one of these buttons does have an unintended consequence to it and, and things that you kind of got to think about and think your way through. But those are the basic, I, said, I think, settings, monitoring, and how you get out of uh, a situation that, you know, you may find yourself in, in terms of oxygenation, ventilation, and lung dosing, and essentially injury. Uh, is what we're preventing here. Okay. Great. Uh, JD, do you, is there any questions for us? Uh, sure. Just a couple of a uh, couple of questions for you. Um, first and foremost, just kind of going over the the um, key parameters. Number one, tidal volume, um, six up to eight cc's per kilogram, but again of ideal body weight because if we have a, a let's say a morbidly um, obese patient, uh, high BMI. Um, their lung volume will not match that level of their BMI per se. The lung volume is actually the same as someone um, of a much smaller BMI, correct? Exactly. And, you know, the, 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 the ideal way of doing this is getting out a tape measure, measuring their height, plugging it into a calculator for what their ideal body weight is, and then calculating off that. Now, you can imagine with COVID patients, we're not going to have a bunch of tape measures lying around to, to measure these patients. So the good news is that's a pretty poor predictor of actual lung size. So I often eyeball it, make a judgment. If it's a smaller person, shoot for 350 or 400. If it's a larger person, shoot for 450. Sometimes in very large person, people even 500. And then the important part is to check your work because that's really going to tell you if you're ventilating at an appropriate or a safe lung volume. And that's when you actually check your plateau pressure. Great. And then moving on to rate the general range, 12 to 20. Obviously, we want higher if we have someone that's acidemic, uh, DKA patient, et cetera. Much lower rate, um, lower than 12 for our asthma, COPD, kind of uh, you know, um, air trapping uh, physiology. What rate do you generally recommend, especially in the setting of COVID-19 illness and what we're seeing um, physiologically? 
So, you know, this is an ever-changing phenomenon as we're seeing these patients. Um, I can tell you with most patients with kind of a lung injury pattern, so the way I like to make this really simple is you have two patterns. You've got obstructive patterns, which is asthma and COPD. That's a whole other monster of ventilating, but a lung injury pattern is mostly what we're talking about. And if you ventilate almost everybody, as you're imagining a, in a lung injury pattern, you'll do fine and you won't hurt people. And that's essentially what we're prescribing here. They're using a low tidal volume, um, using your PEEP and FiO2 to titrate to your SAT, and then your respiratory rate to monitor your CO2. So what I typically will start with is in patients is a respiratory rate of 15 to 18. And I kind of base that on what, what their minute ventilation was before I put them on the ventilator. If I think they have a bunch of metabolic acidosis, and when I say metabolic acidosis, that really just means they have a higher CO2 load that you have, they have to breathe off, and I'll base it on that. And then I check my work relatively quickly with a blood gas to tell me what their actual PCO2 is and if I have to change my respiratory rate based off of that. So you recommend starting off just as you are in this um, this model here in the the sixteen range, kind of it, right in the splitting the difference in that twelve to twenty general range. Yep, yep. If they're breathing a little faster, faster, or they're a little acidotic, as I when I'm putting them on on the, the ventilator, I'll turn it up to eighteen to twenty. If they aren't, I'll bring it down to fifteen or so, and then and then I typically will follow up with a blood gas to see where I am. Great. And then for the um, FiO2 and PEEP, I think the key takeaway is to, when you think of one, think of the other um, and sort of move them, um, as you mentioned, in, in step uh, with one another. And we'll send out the, um, the PEEP and FiO tables uh, as follow-up. Yeah. And, it, and it, it's, it's fairly safe and easy to titrate by your oxygen saturation rather than waiting on a blood gas, which can take a long time and, and you just, you know, you, you end up getting behind. Excellent. And then for the flow, we didn't talk as much about flow. It's certainly not one of the uh, four parameters that's listed on the bottom, uh, but the, the um, base flow rate is, uh, is it 60 um, that it's sort of the default flow rate? Yeah, Eric, we'll hit it. So if you just hit that button. So the, so the, the arrows that you see here are, it, it's trying to indicate to you that there's collapsed data. Uh, I'm going to hit the arrow itself and that data set it spans. Uh, you can see there's uh, several more kind of granular settings. Um, the, when, when, a, when a volume is actually delivered into a patient, um, a ventilator platform could pick one of two ways to ask you how fast you want to deliver that volume in. Um, we typically think of flow, uh, and that is okay. Many, many, many ventilators do set a flow rate for 60 liters a minute or so, uh, and that's, that's good. Uh, this particular ventilator platform, uh, however, has chosen to ask you uh, how much time do you want to limit inspiration to. So instead of setting a flow rate, you're actually setting an inspiratory time directly. Um, and so it gets a little bit uh, kind of tricky here. I, I would direct you you need to be at 0.75 seconds or less to, to get that volume in. Uh, at the same flow rate. Yeah. So I, 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 I would try to, I didn't want to bring up flow too much because I think it overcomplicates things for the most part. And usually you can get away without knowing anything about flow. Um, what I did want to know is when you're setting these modes of ventilation, you are controlling the flow. And that can be exquisitely uncomfortable for patients because we breathe at a different flow pattern than most ventilators deliver. Um, and so usually when patients start to become non-compliant with your vent, meaning they, they don't like your settings, a lot of it can do with controlling the flows. And so one of the, the things that we usually do to fix it, and this is probably like I said, we're talking about another lecture where we talk about troubleshooting the vent, but one of the simple things we do is switching from volume control to pressure control, because if you remember my diagram, as you go from volume control to pressure control, you allow the patient to control their own flows. Great. And then, but I think to start off, kind of ignore the flow as best you can and just set it at the, at the default setting. Excellent. And then the um, inspiratory pause, the plateau pressure, the, the metric, the number that we're really looking at. And if you could just go on the vent one, one more time and just show us the buttons to press, um, 30 or less is the uh, yep. pressure. That we're so doing. maneuvers here on, on the left side of the screen, static measurements, inspiratory hold, hold it till you hear your beep. 
There it is. And you can see I've paused here and I measure that pressure and it comes up at 25 right now. And that was because I've been playing with the peep. That's why it increased. Excellent. Well, I, I do want to thank um, both Dr. Spiegel and Eric Kreiner for, um, for joining us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, um, and we'll transition to um, answering additional questions uh, that folks may have. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. And for everyone that's on the line, please stay on for a few minutes if you'd like, and uh, we'll open it up for additional questions. But thanks so much to Rory and to Eric for, uh, for joining us. This has been fantastic. Thank you, guys.